Welcome back to our Friday edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. We are bringing back a guest that we had back in July, and he has not been with us since, but we thought we'd bring him back one more time because this is the end, my friend. It is the end of the UCP leadership race. We have less than three weeks until the vote. We have less than 10 days until memberships have to be, or ballots have to be in to be considered a uh, ballot uh, for the race. And we thought we would recap the last few months, but also look back on the legacy of the current premier of Alberta, Jason Kenney. And to do that, we wanted to bring back Dave Cornier of Dave Berta. Dave, thank you so much for doing this once again. Thank you for having me back on, Chris. I'm I'm excited to talk about it. There's lots to talk about. I mean, it's kind of at the, the end of the end of the uh, the uh, the UCP leadership 2022 era. But as you know, as anybody who pays attention to Alberta politics knows, um, you know this is not the end of anything. It's just the beginning of you know what comes next. Because the, uh, the beginning of the 23 election <laughs> it starts on October well, 11th. That's that that's it, and it's it'll be the beginning of the. Uh, Daniel Smith premiership or the Travis Taves premiership and or you know Brian Jean premiership or who knows yeah I mean this is we'll talk we can talk about about how ballot you know the the balloting process works and and uh you know who might uh who might end up on top it's it's uh there's a bit of bit of math going on there so let's start there because this is our final episode before the ballots are well our final episode about politics provincially um until the ballots are counted this is a closer race than um, most probably people thought this was going to be at the beginning of this. People might have assumed that one candidate was going to run away with it with the endorsements from the majority of caucus. But it seems like another candidate, former Wild Rose leader Daniel Smith, turned PC MLA, Daniel Smith is running away with this. Polls are polls. We can talk about polls later, but... Is this how you would have shaped up the race at the beginning of this a few months ago when we first sat down to talk about this? I, I don't think anybody would have thought the race would turn t- taken the turn that it did. Uh, um, I mean, <laughs> that you know, back in May after the the leadership review, Kenny won slash lost the leadership review, uh, and and the race really started. I mean, I think Danielle Smith was the first can. I think she was the first candidate to actually announce. I think she just she announced, announced just, before he even lost. He, yeah, she announced yeah. at the SGM in Red Deer that that's right. If he loses, I'm running. That's right. And there's actually a funny photo that I saw. Well, a funny photo. There's a photo I saw circulated online uh, back during the, the special general meeting of Kenny on stage, and it was like a photo of him from the back and of the him speaking, and then of the audience. And in the in at the back of the crowd was Daniel Smith actually speaking to reporters as Kenny was speaking on stage. Um, so you know she was actually declaring <laughs> declaring her intentions to run as you know as he was speaking before he'd even lost the leadership review. Um, no, I don't think anybody really would have predicted it. It, it would it would have gone quite this way in terms of the the the, the candidates who seem to be seem to be the front runners, especially Daniel Smith. Um, I mean, I thought you know. I think I said this on one of, in one of our previous conversations that I think a lot of politicos um, misunderstood her candidacy or under uh, under 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 underrated her in terms of this race because as politicos we were you know we pay we pay so much attention to politics sometimes that sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees um, you know we all remember the 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 floor crossing back in 2014 when she you know left deserted the wild rose party and joined jim prentice in the pc party which ended up being a disastrous decision for conserv for the conservative movement and the conservative both both of those conservative parties um and the ndp won the, ne- the next election a few months later um but you know what what maybe we hadn't clued into is that you know over the past seven years in between you know she's been the host of a popular radio show call-in radio show she has cultivated a base of support she's you know she's she's really identified and honed in on you know especially during the pandemic of a group of Albertans who were angry who were very motivated um and unhappy with the current political establishment you know and you know a lot of them a lot of the a lot of these people were uh you know people who were skeptical of covid or skeptical of covid restrictions or skeptical of vaccinations and continue to be um but she really spoke to them and as we saw during the during the leadership review this was a really motivated 
part of the conservative base in this province, and they showed up to vote against Jason Kenney in the leadership review. And right, it seems right now, uh, you know, watching social media, talking to uh, talking to politicos, talking to, to conservatives, it seems that they're showing up again for Daniel Smith in this in this leadership race, and it's really turned the tables on the establishment favorite Travis Taves, who who looked like the front runner coming out of the gates. He had he came out with the support of. 26 or 27 UCP MLAs. He has the support of the consultant class. You know, the political establishment is behind him. Uh, you know, he's a credible candidate. He speaks in full sentences. He's, you know, he has a, has a, uh, uh, you know, background as an accountant, as a rancher. Um, you know, he looks good in a business suit. He looks good in cowboy boots. He can ride a horse without looking foolish. Um, but it, you know that it, it, is he a dud in this, though in, in this race? Let's, can, can, well, can I can I ask that question with all due respect to Mr. Taze mm -hmm. because uh, he, he seems like a good guy. I, I I met him once. I've had a conversation with him quickly, but he seems like a good guy. But when you go to a Smith can, uh, a rally. You see people hanging on to everything she says mm -hmm. from the moment she starts talking to the end. People are clapping like they're hooting and hollering and they're excited about what she's saying. I went to an event here in Northeast Calgary with uh, Travis and. Well, let's put it this way. The applause was coming from, I think, their fluffer for the campaign, whoever that was, because it was always the same gentleman clapping and starting the clap. Whereas mm -hmm. as a Danielle event, it was everyone who was doing it. I could be wrong. It could be an actual, just a really go-getter uh, supporter of Travis, but it doesn't seem like he connected with the people as much as Danielle did. Like his delivery of his speeches, of his uh, the content wasn't there. And maybe that's what Alberta, he thinks Alberta needs is someone who's not razzle dazzle and who can bore you to sleep like Mac Michael Ignatieff did. But <laughs> like, is, 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 am I just off base there? No, I, I don't think I, you know, there's definitely not the same type of excitement with the Travis Taves campaign as, as the, as you know, I mean, if I, I would consider Smith and Taves as kind of the two main front runners, I think Brian Jean is in the, probably in the mix. Um, but, you know, I think this is a Smith-Taves a Smith, a Smith race. A set of Smiths. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, no, I think that's probably pretty accurate and from, from what I've seen. You know, he's, D Danielle Smith is polished. She's done this before. I mean, she's is run she a polished, though? Podcast. Is she polished? Uh, you know, I think, I know I'm polished in terms of, I think she knows how to speak to her crowd, knows how to speak to her audience, yeah. right? Like, you know, she's not a... Uh, she's speaking to a certain group of people and she knows who she needs to mobilize and who she needs to speak to in terms in to, to win this leadership race. And the, you know, my, my, the big interesting unanswered question is if she does win, uh, you know, will she tone down the rhetoric? Will she uh, try to appear more moderate? Will she back down on some of these kind of more fanciful things and, and outrageous things like the Alberta sovereignty act, like, you know, firing the entire Alberta Health Services Board and decentralizing healthcare in Alberta, like big, you know, pretty massive items. Um, you know, will she stop playing, you know, with the with the COVID conspiracy theorists and the separatists? Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe she'll think that that group is motivated enough to bring her to win her the next election. And I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I wouldn't think so, but you know, it, it may, it may be enough to win her or, or you know, give her a shot to win the, uh, the UCP leadership race. We talked about math at the beginning of this. Well, you said math and I'm always a math fan, especially in these ranked ballot situations. And I, you would know this better than I do, but the candidate who usually places first without getting a majority ends up not winning on the second or third ballot. And I go back mm -hmm. to the 2011 race where we had perceived front runner, and I want to make Gary Marr, who on the first ballot got 40%. And I say 40% because a recent poll from the Smith campaign said she is at 40% and the other ones are at 28 and 17. And that's Brian Jean or Travis Taves and Brian Jean respectively. Looking back at that 2011 leadership race for the progressive conservatives, Gary Marr had 40%, Alison Redford had 18%, and Doug Horner had 14% on that first ballot. Um, are we about to see if Daniel Smith uh, gets uh, less than 40% of Travis Taves uh, 
a premiership because it seems like conservatives don't like to go to the front runner if after the first ballot. So could they potentially be going to Travis Taves? What's your thoughts on the math here? Because the math to me is very hard. And I, mm-hmm. and I say that to a callback to Jim Prentice and uh, uh, Rachel Notley. <laughs> math is hard in this situation because I don't know where people are going. Because yeah. while Smith is giving the olive branches to the other campaigns right now, it seems like a little too late to be giving the olive branches after sort of doing a burn the burn the party to the ground and let the Phoenix rise up, which is Daniel Smith's premiership and the Daniel Smith UCP race. Yeah, and I, I think the the big difference between, I mean, you're right, the second place votes are really what's going to matter, especially if Daniel Smith doesn't get more than 50% on the first ballot, because if, if she gets 50% plus one, you think on the she first does? Ballot, she, she wins. No, no, but I mean, if she does, she no, wins. No, but do you think she uh, does? Do you think if the, if the election was held today, do you think she would be able to do it? I'm putting you I, on I the spot here. I, I, I think it, I think it's po- I think it's possible. I think it's possible. She, you know, it, from from my vantage point, it looks like she has the only group of of supporters who are enthusiastic, energetic, and mobilized to get out and vote for her. Um, whether that's enough or not, um, you know, I will find out soon after the sixth, but or on the sixth. But um, uh, I, I don't see that kind of motivation or that kind of excitement or enthusiasm from the other campaigns. I, I will say that the, the one of the big differences or the big difference between the the PC leadership races where we referred to so 20, 2011 and even if you want to go back even further to 2006, the ones where the front the front runner didn't win because of the second place choices is that those races were the first vote, the first ballot vote and the second ballot vote took place. There was a week separating or a week or two separating the two. And the way the system worked is that people could go and buy memberships at any point. So you could walk up to the voting booth on on you know <laughs> on uh, you know for for to on voting day and uh, for the first ballot and buy a membership. You could even if you even didn't vote in the first ballot, you could buy a membership for the second ballot and go and vote. So you could kind of see you know it was a lot more of a public race. Whereas this is this is a ballot that members will send in or drop off uh, or already have with their with their first, second, third, fourth, fifth choices already chosen and. The other thing, the other key difference is that the membership cutoff was back in August. So, and that's a big difference because I think that the the race, the UCP leadership race would have been quite different had there been an opportunity for people to still buy memberships in the race, seeing where it went in the last month. I think with all the conversation around the uh, the Alberta Sovereignty Act and, and, and stuff like that, I think that, you know, there could have been a real anybody but Danielle Smith kind of campaign that would have mobilized behind one of the candidates as, as the, as the choice for, you know, people who were maybe weren't necessarily engaged in the UCP or might not even really be, or might, might just be casual conservatives. I mean, we don't have the five minute Tories like you did in the, with the, with the UCP or with the PC leadership races where you had people buying memberships to vote for the leadership and then they'd never be members again. This is a more engaged group of people. It's a lot of people with more than a hundred thousand memberships sold. Um, but there's no opportunity for the kind of uh, um, uh, mobilization at this point during the campaign, which I think I, I, looking at it, looking, looking at the candidates, I think hurts, hurts candidates like, uh, like Rebecca Schultz and Rajan Sani, for example, who are, I would say are probably more moderate conservatives who would probably, you know, appeal to a broader, you know, a broader group of, of Albertans politically um, but they didn't seem to really, you know, before the lead, before the membership cut off, they didn't really seem to take off or really seem to get a lot of traction or enough traction to really be contenders. But I think had we been under the previous system with the PC party, you might see that those candidates become more, con- more of the contenders than they are, actually are now. I want to, I want to take you back because that while we've, last time we chatted was the end of July and it seems mm-hmm. like a lot has happened in the last two months in this race. But I want to go to a specific uh, moment in this race in the last uh, last few weeks, actually, when Travis Taves, Brian Jean, Leela here, and Rajon Sani all got up on a stage and said, we're united against the Sovereignty Act. Um, I- I'm not sure uh, what it was like up in Ca- uh, Edmonton, but here in Calgary, I had conservatives, conservatives, like card carrying conservatives reach out to me and said they just handed Daniel Smith the election because it all looks like now it's the gang up against Danielle Smith this late in the game. What was your take on that moment in this race? Was that the moment when this race was kind of a unknown entity? Because right now, I don't know 
who is second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh right now. All I can tell you is Daniel Smith is topping the first ballot. That's that's clear to me. Yeah, I, I think that that press conference made them all look weak. Honestly, yeah. I think it, I think it ma- it made them look weak. And I mean, what what they should have done if they were really united against Daniel Smith is they should have said, you know, there's four. They, they have four the four of them should have sat down in the, before the press conference and said, okay, this is a clear and present danger. This is a clear and present present threat to the conservative movement to the the UCP winning re-election in 2023. Um, which one of us is going to be the the anybody but Daniel Smith candidate? And then they should have, and this is easier said than done, right? Because the, you know they've all invested, and they all know, have egos. hundreds of thousands. They all have egos, and they've invested hundreds of thousands of their friends' money in these campaigns and and, and stuff like that. So then, so I get it; it's not an easy decision to make. But but really, I mean, if that that would have been a more powerful, much more powerful uh, uh, um, move to say, you know what, we're all backing Taves, we're all backing Gene, Gene. or one of one of one of one of them. That, you know, because we believe that this is this is this is a threat. Instead, you're going to have weird votes splits and second place candidates or second choices going to you know split between candidates. And maybe the campaigns have been working together and trying to align and trying to send signals to their their other supporters about who the second place candidates, who the second place choices choices should be. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's some of that implied already in the campaigns. Um, but you know, I mean, people will vote for people will vote for who they vote for. And, you know, just because they support one candidate on the first ballot, they might, you know, they might disagree. They might say, well, I like Travis, but, you know, uh, you know, Danielle's my second choice, or, you know, I like Jean, but Rebecca's my second choice or something like that. Um, was so you was might it have shocking weird... to you that uh, Rebecca wasn't there? Because I, I found that the most interesting out of the whole day, because yeah. if you want to unite it front saying this is bad, you you get all the candidates, even Todd Lowen, which I guarantee he would not have attended anyway, because it seems mm-hmm. like his his vote is more of the Danielle Smith vote. Uh, sure. But with N- Rebecca not there, it looked like a weak united front, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. No, it did. It, it looked it looked weak. And uh I mean, I, you know, they're obviously, they're, they're concerned and they're a little desperate, they're desperate about what, about what, about what to do about, about this, because I think she presents a very different vision of, of the conservative movement than those other candidates do. And, and she presents a threat to the conservative establishment. And I mean, really, she presents a threat to the, the, the UCP's chances of re-election in 2023. Do you not think to say so? That Daniel do you Smith, think so? Not to say uh, that, I, I think, I think in a lot of writings, I think, yeah, I think so. I think that uh, Daniel Smith, I don't think she she should be underestimated. I'm not, not saying the UCP couldn't get reelected or won't get reelected if Daniel Smith becomes premier, but I think there's a whole host of issues that the UCP is going to be, UCP candidates are going to have to present to Albertans uh, if Daniel Smith is premier than they would if if another another one of those candidates weren't premier. So, you know, I mean, we've already seen the kind of messaging, just talking about the, the, the opposition to the UCP going in the next election. So talking about the, the NDP, I mean, we're looking at, everything the NDP and Rachel Notley have been saying over the past few months, it's, it looks like that, you know, their slogan is going to be something on, along the lines of uh, jobs, education, and healthcare. And, you know, those seem to be, those are probably three key issues that Al- a lot of Albertans are concerned about. I'm not sure that Albertans really want to go uh, go to the polls on the issues of sovereignty, on the issues of co- or having to talk about COVID all over again. I'm not sure that that's really, that's really where Albertans are, but um, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll see. We, we certainly will. I, I, <laughs> if you would have asked me in May when we first sat down that we'd be talking about sovereignty and autonomy the last five months before this race, I would have said you're up creek without a paddle, but here we are. Yeah. If Danielle Smith yeah. knows how to do something, she knows how to make the election about a certain issue. And I, I say oh, that, I'm so, I'm so, go ahead. No, no, I, I was just going to say that, that's, that's, that's absolutely right. And the, the amount of oxygen that the uh, the discussion around the Alberta Sovereignty Act has sucked up in this leadership race. I mean, that's the key, def- seems to be the key defining issue that anyone has really been talking about in this in this leadership race. Well, and I, and I said that to a group of people that I play poker with on a regular basis. I said, what can you think, what can you remember about the last few months? And it goes back to what sort of the federal conservatives did as well. Pierre Polyev was the king of making the election about one thing, gatekeepers. You keep on saying it over and over again. People are going to put it in their head. Daniel Smith did the exact same thing, kept on talking about the Sovereignty Act. People picked up on the Sovereignty Act. And 
we didn't even have the wording and we still don't have the exact wording of what the bill, the Sovereignty Act is going to be. We have a description of what it's based on, but nothing about actual policy that it's going to affect. So I give Daniel Smith some credit for making this election about something, even though that something was nothing until about two weeks ago. Here we are. Quick question. We are <laughs> we are two weeks away from this uh, the end of this race. I want to talk about the guy who is about to leave provincial politics, who rode in on his white uh, white horse, save the conservative movement in this uh, province, according to him, uh, united the conservative fractions and took the conservatives back to power from the NDP. And that is Jason Kenney. Jason Kenney has been a weird leader in this uh, uh, transition period. I've never, and this is why I'm asking this quick question to you, I've had this quick, very long-winded question. Uh, I've never seen a leader inter- in- inject themselves into a leadership race as much as he has done over the last few weeks. What, what's his play here? He's, Jason Kenney is a political animal, unlike anything, any, anyone we've seen uh, in the premier's office in Alberta, I think it's, it's, it's in his blood. He has literally done politics all his life. It's his profession. Um, I just don't, I don't think he could help himself. I think that, you know, he, he got kicked out of his party. And I think there's, I think there's some, probably some bitterness, probably some resentfulness going on there, but I think he also sees the direction this is going and the party is being, it looks like in this leadership race is being taken in a, a very different direction than, uh, than what he had envisioned uh, when the UCP was created five years ago, five years ago. Um, you know, I mean, to get, to give Jason Kenny credit, I mean, you know, he did, he, he accomplished some, you know, a pretty big thing in Alberta politics. He united two factions of the conservative movement in this province that, you know, were at, had been at each other's throats for the past 10 years, the previous 10 years. Um, and, uh, you know, he united them under the banner of defeating the NDP in 2019. And they did that. And, you know, it, lasted for you know you think the good things for him lasted for a while and then it totally fall, fell apart because really i mean you know he had there was the, the pandemic crisis and and you know a lot of other things that his government and governments everywhere across the country and across the world have had to deal with but but what they also discovered pretty quickly is that all those things that those two warring factions didn't like about each other when they were two separate parties they still didn't like about each other when they became one united party so the difference was they were still all sitting in the room together, right? And they already had power. So, you know, there was no, you know, the, 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 the impetus to stay united, uh, you know, it's, you know, it, when it looks like you're going to win anyway, uh, you know, which at, at some points it did, um, or, you know, the election seems really far off, you know, there's the, you know, the, the idea of staying united, um, you know, when you really don't like what the other the guy sitting across the room for you, from you, even though they're in the same party is saying, uh, you know, the, the unity really isn't there. And, you know, he became a target. And uh, is the know, unity back is, I think, is the unity issue well, we'll over see. with? Because I, I and it goes, this is going to go into our second uh, sort of our follow up question. Mm-hmm. This is this party seems more divided than it was in February when Jason Kenney got the heave ho or March when Jason Kenney got the heave ho. Um, can can a new leader like a Daniel Smith unite the party? Because I don't think it's going to happen to you. I think, I mean, I think we'll be surprised at how many people fall in line if she wins, how many people fall in line and support the leader because they want to keep their jobs as MLAs. I think there'll be a lot of that. I think there will, there will be people if, if they do, you know, if she does bring in a, a host of, of characters who are fringe conservatives and, you know, people who offend the establishment class and, and even just offend moderate conservatives. Uh, you know, I think that, that you know there will be pushback but i think there'll be a lot of falling in line um and a lot of it will depend on polling a lot of it will depend on you know the election is coming up in may at the latest may 2023 I mean, okay could, i've been hearing rumors earlier, and but... this, sorry i've been hearing rumors <laughs> that the fixed election date has been scrapped right they do not need like the new premier does not need to call an election in may they have up to potentially 12 months to call the next election. Am I right? Or am I getting wrong information from conservatives right now? Well, I don't know that it's, I don't think it's been scrapped. It's still in legislation. It's the last or the, the, 
the last Monday in May, I think, is when it went, went with the legislation still. Okay, exists. from what I've I mean, been told, the, and I apologize, and we uh, this is this is how bad of knowledge I, I think they should have prepared for this, but they said that when they brought in the recall legislation, they rewrit most of the election rules as well, and it's it, it is prefer, preferred to be the last Monday of May, but it doesn't have to be the last Monday of May. So maybe it's well, something. And I mean, I'm I'll, wrong. I'll, Conservatives I'll are giving me I wrong I, information. No, 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 no. <laughs> that, I, I, it, it flew. If it, that flew, if that flew under my radar, then uh, and that's a that's a, pr- a pretty then 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 I guess that's the case. If it flew under my radar, I don't I don't recall them to make, make, making that change. But under the the constitution, I mean, legislatures can last for five years. Yeah. So you know, we have these provincial fixed election dates, but you know, the constitution kind of supersedes that kind of stuff. I would think. I'm not a lawyer, but. You know, you could make an argument that that a legislature could last for five years because the Constitution says it can. Hey, so, you know, Bob the, the, Ray the did four it. Look how well that day. went over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it usually doesn't end very well. I think Kim Campbell did it as well with the, with yeah. the, the federal PCs. It usually, usually when governments drag out for the full, almost the full five years, it usually means they're in a lot of trouble and they want to put off calling an election to, you know, hope things turn around. And usually they don't. So, um but you know we'll we'll see i mean i think a lot of people are i think a lot of people are expecting an election to happen in the next uh, in the next year um but you know we'll see what the polls we'll see what the polls say and whether you know whether the next premier gets a gets a bump or you know or whether whether you know what depends what the polls look like that's that's really what's going to be what's going to be the defining factor <laughs> you have been known in alberta as the guy who sort of announces who's running in which riding and you follow nominations quite closely and i say quite closely because i'm pretty sure everyone knows who you are and dave berta.ca um this new premier is going to have candidates who were ready to run under jason kenny um mm-hmm. Can we see a new slate of candidates in some of these UCP nominated uh, writings already? And I, I say that because I know there are some speculation, and this is all speculation that I'm saying here, and I, I've never confirmed, but I've never got a, say a no, but there is concern that some current MLAs who are nominated may say if a certain candidate wins, I'm done, I'm over with, I'm leaving the party and I'm going to actually rescind my nomination. I'm going to write off retirement in style. Do you see that happening? Do you see a potential new slate of candidates coming forward and asking to be asking the party to hold nominations again? For sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you have a candidate who's, you know, the the co-chair has gone all in on one of the other candidates and, uh, you know, doesn't see a future for, maybe they don't see a future for themselves in cabinet if they're already a cabinet minister, or maybe they don't see themselves as having a future in cabinet if they're not a cabinet minister under a different leader. You know, they might decide that this is, you know, I I don't really want to ride out the next four years as a backbencher, or, you know, I don't really want to ride out the next four years having to defend this, uh, you know, the the policies of the government of a leader that uh, that I don't uh, that I don't support or don't I don't want to have to run under, under run for re-election under this person and you know maybe I'll come back and maybe I'll run for a nomination four years from now. So I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that. I think that's pretty natural that you get some you know you'll get some churn um, when uh, when a new leader comes in. Um, you know, there are already I think it's thirty five candidates the UCP's nominated so far. I wouldn't be surprised to see some of them decide to uh, decide to. To not run, decide to to give up their uh, to forfeit their candidacy. Um, remember, Daniel Smith also said uh, earlier on in the leadership race that, um, and it, we're talking we're talking basically. <laughs> I, I I feel like we're talking as if she's already won, but um, no, I'm but, I'm, uh, I'm you know, even she, saying she, like a Pat Wren, like if Pat Wren or Peter Guthrie uh, have to run <laughs> under Travis Taves, are they going well, to want to if they? Uh, we're so gung ho about, uh, and I know Pat Wren. We can we can laugh at Pat Wren for a few minutes if we want. But well, J- 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 Jason Kenney said he wouldn't sign Pat Wren's nomination papers. So, but Jason Pat- Kenney's not going to be signing the nomination papers <laughs> exactly. next time. So, and he he pissed you know, off Travis uh, Taves. So I can imagine that Travis Taves is not going to want to sign his nomination papers after bolting to Danielle Smith. But do you see even like, uh, like I said, Peter Guthrie or um, Nate, uh, I forget, Blubish, I think his last name was. Nate Blubish. Yeah, yeah. Running under yeah. a Travis Taves after saying, hey, I'm endorsing you, but not really anymore. I'm going to go and go run again, uh, run under Daniel Smith. 
Yeah, well, that's the, you know, you get to see who the, you know, who the, oppor- <laughs> the oppor- real opportunists are at that point. And I think in terms of, uh, of I mean, you know, Pat Wren's a little, a little different because he's, you know, uh, he's had, he's already been out of the Conservative caucus once. He carries a boatload of controversy with him. Um, you know, from what I understand, you know, the UCP won't have a hard time finding a better candidate to run in that riding than him. Um, so, I, but, but someone like, like Nate Glubish, you know, that's that, you know, he's in cabinet now, he's the minister of service, Alberta, but you know, when he decided to switch his endorsements from Travis Taves to Daniel Smith, you know, that was, he was trying to, he was reading where the wind was blowing. And, you know, he said, was probably thinking to himself, my chances of, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a very junior cabinet minister in Kenny's cabinet, and I haven't really um, generated much controversy. I haven't really, you know, I've demonstrated I'm a decent cab, decent junior cabinet minister. There could be a future for me if I back the right horse. Um, you know, if he, you know, if his horse doesn't win, you know, he, he might not be, might not be in cabinet again in, in a couple of weeks. Um, but then again, he is a Edmonton area MLA and there aren't too many Edmonton area UCP MLAs. Can we talk so, about Casey Madu no. for a second? What's going on? What's oh going boy. on? Oh What's boy. going on with Casey Madu? Because I have never seen a politician go so hard after absolutely nothing that I have seen with Casey Madu. What's going on? Because you're from Edmonton. You you know the people oh, yeah. in Edmonton. What's going on with Casey? Or sorry, the K- Honorable K- Casey Madu. K- K- Casey Madu is, uh, I mean, you're probably referring to a, to a, a tweet that he put out the other night. So he endorsed Daniel Smith and then he put yeah. out this tweet Uh, And I don't have it right in front of me, but it was basically talking about, you know, how the authoritarian COVID restrictions, you know, the freedom fighters from the from the freedom convoy where that were, you know, were our heroes for standing up to the authoritarian COVID restrictions. But he was the minister of justice when the provincial government implemented the COVID restrictions here in Alberta. And there was a quote floating online um, from one one reporter, I think it was Johnny Wakefield um, from one of the post media papers who, who tweeted it. Um, that, uh, you know, he was, he, he, he was, you know, he was basically saying that people need to abide by the law and, and abide by these, these COVID restrictions. So, you so know, I'm going to read the tweet here because met, I pulled it up, okay, I pulled okay, it up you, because I want to make sure we get it correct here. Okay. It never was about science, but political control and power. Thanks to all those citizens, freedom convoys who had the courage to mobilize against these tyrannical policies. They endured a lot of hate name calling suffered and vile and and vilified on behalf of all of us i thank them yeah (laughs) didn't he give peace officers more powers to control people to get them to not do what they're doing yeah i i i i I believe so (laughs) i think i mean casey madu is He's he's endorsed Daniel Smith. He's auditioning to be the justice minister or to be a senior cabinet minister in Daniel Smith's new cabinet. That's really what he's doing, uh, and it's it's political total political opportunism. And AC Madu is going to be you know the chances of him keeping his seat in the next election if the polls hold up to what they are are very slim. I, you know the NDP have nominated Nathan Ip, who's a three term school board trustee in 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 Edmonton, to run against him, high profile candidate. Um, you know it's. It's it's going to be very hard for him to keep his seat in the next election. I think that's that's really what it's all about. But it's but it's nuts. Like this is you know they've they've you know gone off the off the off the off into the deep end on this stuff. Um, I want to turn to the NDP for a few seconds, and then I want to turn to Jason Kennedy and what he leaves behind. Um, the NDP have kind of gone quiet, and I say that with kind of respect over the last few months because. They've been slowly nominating candidates in across the province. They've been getting ready for the upcoming uh, leadership, uh, the upcoming provincial election, whenever it shall be. Um, What's your thoughts on what's happened with the NDP? Because you think they would have been front and center trying to get ahead of who was going to be premier, but they've been taking sort of a wait and see approach and wait to see who the UCP select instead of attacking the perceived front runner i know rachel notley did come out with a Mm -hmm. press release or a press conference about the sovereignty act but that was the only foyer into this race that the ndp did was it a smart move well well, well, when when your opponent is beating themselves up you don't want to interrupt (laughs) them or stop them or give them another target right i mean it won't be long before 
uh, the, you know, the, when, when the dust settles in the UCP race, they'll start, the, you know, the UCP will start turning their, their sites more on the NDP, I think. And you can see candidates like Travis Taves and Rebecca Schultz have really tried to pivot and really tried to push the, you know, the, the push the, the narrative in the race about who can beat the NDP, um, which is not really what, what Daniel Smith is really talking about. I mean, she, they kind of talked about it, but not, not, not really. This is really about a more, a more ideological fight within the conservative movement. Um, yeah, so I think the NDP have just not been, not been probably smartly not, not wanting to insert themselves in the UCP race and again, give the UCP a big target to unite against and let them, let them beat, beat themselves up. They have been busy nominating candidates. I think they've have like 45 or 46 candidates nominated, which is now in more than half the ridings. There are 87 ridings across the province. Um, they have about a dozen more nomination meetings scheduled, some some of them pretty hotly contested. Um, you know, Are you surprised nomination... at the retirements that have been coming out of the party? Like a Darren Billis, like a John Carson, like a uh, Richard Fian. Like I, I've been shocked uh, because do you think this would have been a perfect opportunity for the NDP to get into power again? And this mm -hmm. potentially, because there are three term uh, MLA cabinet positions for some of these people again? Oh, for sure. Some of them would have, would have returned to cabinet. I mean, if Darren Billis had decided to run again there's, in the NDP formed government, there's no doubt in my mind that he would be a, a senior cabinet minister. Um, but I mean, he's also been an MLA for 10 years and maybe he wants to do other things. I mean, you know, these, these MLAs, I mean, Billis served three terms, John Carson served two terms, Richard Fian served two terms and Richard Fian was, you know, he's getting to retirement age now. So that's, that's not too surprising. There's going to be some turnover. There's, this is a, these are, but it's not much pretty, to look into, right? It's like I no, you, I you're not reading too much so. into it. Not not really. There's, I mean, it, you know, John Carson, he'd served two terms. He was a candidate who probably wasn't expected to be elected. <laughs> you know, he was elected in the wave in 20 in 2015. And, you know, he turned out to be a pretty good constituency MLA. And he did it for eight years. And now he's moving on. So I don't, you know, I, I, if, if someone like Sarah Hoffman or Shannon Phillips decided to, or Joe Cece decided to uh to, to not run again, then that would raise more, you know, red flags about maybe some internal issues or, you know, why people asking questions about why they're not running again. But I think of the, the NDP MLAs who've declared they're not running again so far, I don't really think it raises any big flags and, and in, in terms of like, in terms of like internal uh, infighting in that. Um, last question, last segment, because we're at, almost at the 40 minute mark. Can, 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 can I, can I, can, can I just, just make a com a quick comment about the NDP's nominations? Sure. Um, the, the nomination candidates that the ND or the people that the NDP have been nominating in Calgary, um, is probably the most like progressive conservative slate that the, uh, that the NDP have ever nominated in Calgary. Um, you have energy analysts, you have business consultants, you have, uh, you know, economic development vice presidents um, be, being nominated under under the NDP banner. So this is really the, the message they're trying to send to Calgary. And whether whether it resonates or not, or whether the NDP is able to learn fully how to speak speak to Calgarians in a way that resonates with Calgarians um, is you know that's yet to be seen coming into the next election. But but the NDP are are have nominated a pretty uh, what I would call a very business friendly uh, progressive conservative slate uh in calgary and okay really, you, you've you know, that, you've opened up pandora's box so i okay. need to play in it sure. for a few seconds if you're okay with this okay thing. absolutely absolutely um, that goes against what the ndp stood for though isn't it and i and i and, and i'm not trying to be rude i'm not trying to be no, disrespectful no. because i see what's happening on twitter and i see people getting angry at the ndp for going against the traditional ndp ways and i have no skin in the game i have no no allegiance to any party right now um but what do you make of the sort of the Twitter underbelly, and I know Twitter is not uh, 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 the truth of what's going on in the world, but people are upset that the NDP are moving to that business friendly, more energy friendly uh, stance than they were 20 years ago, five years ago, yeah. 10 years ago. This isn't your grandfather's NDP. That's I mean that's that's really what the, what the answer is. This is a uh, it's a more moderate, more liberal-ish polit political party, and you know they they want to win seats in Calgary. Their path to victory, the NDP's path to victory in the next election, go, goes straight through Calgary, and they have to win big in Calgary. And I mean, obviously, they've determined that 
you know, these are the types of candidates that can boost their credibility in a play in, in, in a city like Calgary on issues like the, on en energy, on the economy, on jobs. Um, so it's not, it's not like shocking to me to see this um, because that's, this is the play. This is, this is their, uh, this is what they believe their path to victory is. And whether, whether that, whether it works or not is another thing, but um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, people on Twitter will complain about stuff like people on Twitter will <laughs> complain about absolutely anything that you put in front of them for God's sakes. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, if yeah, yeah. I, I'm not going to get myself in any more trouble. Oh, I will. People. Oh, it's okay. I get the hate mail. I mean, if you don't, if you, if, if, if you want a left-wing political party, go start a left-wing political party. That's my, that's what, that's what I got to say. Okay. There's tons of right-wing political parties being started up in Alberta. The fringe right-wing <laughs> political party machine is a cottage industry in Alberta, but, you know, start a left-wing political party or join the Green Party. Okay, now you've opened, you've really opened Pandora's box, so I have, this This needs okay. to be discussed. Okay, we have, know, okay, okay. We have not talked <laughs> about the biggest, not the biggest, but the, the f flood of candidates for the alberta liberal uh the alberta liberal party leadership this happened in september oh yeah we didn't talk oh, about this. i know <laughs> we've been talking about the ucp i want to do a quick uh ra rapid fire here because i, I know okay. we're short time okay. but alberta liberals are they done and i and i know there's going to be at least a few alberta liberals who are going to send me a message saying hey we're not done we're still here and i'm going to say well come on the show and don't switch your party like last minute that makes me mm -hmm. have to run around to then re-record an episode with a former alberta liberal party <laughs> candidate so <laughs> alberta liberals are they just completely done are they over they, with is it like is it time to close up shop and go somewhere else they are very deep in the wilderness right now. They're very deep in the wilderness. It's hard to see in the next election or the election after that, and maybe even the election after that, them being a factor. Yeah, I so, agree. You know, I mean, maybe maybe in twenty years they'll come back, but but right now they're just they're they're such a non-entity. Is it the Trudeau Alberta brand? Politics. Is it the Trudeau brand that hurt them, or is it just? I think it's Alberta liberals are just liberals. I think it's part of, it. I think the Trudeau brand is part of it. Um, you know, the, the, I think that the, from, you know, my personal experience having worked for the liberal party in the two thousands, when they were the official opposition, I think it was really clear by 2008 and after that election, that the liberals were less of a political party and more of a coalition of independents that were, you know, opposed to the PCs and you had the party, you had candidates who were, you know, basically anybody who survived the 2008 election as a liberal wasn't really elected as a liberal, but they were elected on their own personal brand. I think people like Laurie Blakeman, people like Hugh McDonald, Kent Hare, Harry Chase, Dave Taylor. Darshan Khan. Darshan, yeah, Darshan Kang, exactly, yeah. Um, next next part I want to speak about quickly, Wild Rose Independence Party. They were riding high. They were doing extremely well. And then their leadership debacle of okay the leader's out the leader's back in the leader's not really in but he's on the elections can or elections alberta website do you have any sense of the if the wild rose independence party is going to even be a factor in this next election because of a strong personality like a daniel smith or a travis taves i don't know what if you're a wild rose independence party voter i don't know what uh what you would I mean, other than having just having an open referendum on independence, but I don't know what Daniel Smith wouldn't give you that 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 Paul Hinman couldn't give you. I mean, uh, Daniel Smith could give you could give you government. Paul Hinman yeah. couldn't give you government. That's what I mean. Sure. So I I don't know I don't know where 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 they fit if Daniel Smith becomes premier if Tavis Taves becomes premier. Um, you know, maybe they'll have a bit of a bounce back. Maybe they'll be a disenchanted. Maybe some of those voters, people who supported Daniel Smith, will go over to to Paul Hinman because they really you know Paul Hinman they means they've really embraced. That whole group has really embraced the kind of COVID conspiracy theories. Are, were you surprised at the Alberta Independence Party? Their leadership uh, vote that took place on the 9th with Arthur, uh, Reverend Arthur, I forget how to pronounce pa, 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 Pawlowski or Pawlowski? Yeah, pa, yeah. Pawlowski, yeah. Um, is, is he kind of seems like a big name that the Independence Party got? Or am I just giving... I guess in, in, in those circles, yeah. I mean, I was, it, it kind of happened really quick. It was... You had a candidate who was running, I think Kath Catherine Kowalczuk, who was running. And former she, liberal former, turned former liberal. Yeah. And, uh, 
and she was the only can red candidate running and then he entered the race and i mean he has a bit of name recognition and has a bit of a, has a bit of a following especially in calgary i don't think it's enough to win a seat or to maybe even really be a factor in the next election but but we'll see quick yeah you know barry barry morishita <laughs> and the alberta party any do they do they <sighs> I like Barry. Barry's been on the show numerous yeah. times. I think he's a good guy. I think he's honestly one of probably a good politician as well. Do you see the Alberta party being a factor in this next election? We had, we had Barry on our last uh, episode of the Dave Berta podcast as our special guest. And he's a great, he was a great guest. I, I, I quite like Barry. He was a really, really a good guy to chat with. Um, the, the Alberta party has to, I, I don't know what their pitch is in this going in this, ele- this next election. Um, if this is a two-way race if the question is you know Danielle you or to, yeah. Danielle or Rachel I don't know where Barry and the Alberta party fit in in this race and that's going to be the challenge for them what is what's their what's their what's their pitch what's why why would you vote Alberta party if if you want really want to get rid of the UCP as government or you really want to stop the NDP from forming government why would you vote for the Alberta party and that's the I think that's the big challenge they have and last but not least is Jordan Wilkie and the Green Party of Alberta. Um, he has announced he is going to basically run the next campaign under the platform of we want PR, proportional representation, and that is what we're going to fight for. Um, talk about uh, what party, will, like that messaging, and he has the message. Can the Greens do it? Can the Greens make PR a ballot issue? <laughs> can they do? No, it? no. Can they make it a ballot issue? I know. Oh, um, maybe. I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, you know, you, you know, you and I and people in this podcast, you know, could probably talk for hours about electoral systems and what we'd like to see. But you know, for the for a normal person, I don't know if it really resonates for people knocking on the doors. I don't think it's in the top issues. I think it's an issue worth talking about, and good for them. And hey, we should talk about he we stole talk a, about electoral reform. He stole a candidate from the liberals. So uh, there you go. <laughs> yes. People are hey, they made news for at least a week on Twitter. Um, or a weekend, they did. I they should did. say. Yeah. Um, last question, and this is the big one. Sure. We are about to be heading into a new era of politics in this province. On October 7th, we are going to wake up to a new premier. The era of Jason Kenney as premier is coming to an end here shortly. What is the legacy of Jason Kenney, do you believe, that is going to have a lasting impact? Because you can look back on the premiers of past and you can define their legacy on one or two issues. What's the issue that Jason Kenney will be remembered for? Well, I mean, he'll be remembered for uniting the the conservative parties, uniting the UCP. We talked about that already. He will be uh, you know, remembered for better or for worse for how the Alberta government handled the COVID pandemic. Um, but I think that, I mean, the two things that stick out in my mind for, for Jason Kenney is, uh, number one, uh, it's, a, it's a warning, you know, the story of Jason Kenney premier is a warning uh, for politicians not to promise more than you can deliver on. And I think that, you know, Jason Kenney really did, you know, he promised the sky jobs, economy pipelines, and stuff that he couldn't control. And, uh, and he talked about it in a way that, you know, that it was going to happen and he couldn't deliver on it. Um, and then the second point is Alberta politics is a total meat grinder. Uh, he, uh, you know, he is, you know, <sighs> premiers don't finish their terms in Alberta. I mean, Rachel Notley was the first premier since Ralph Klein to finish a full term as premier. Um, you know, go back before her, it's Ed Stelmack, it's Allison Redford, it's, uh, you know, Jim Prentice, Prentice it's, Hancock, uh, you know, Alberta Pol- <laughs> and yeah, p- Premier, you know, Alberta politics is r- a rough sport. And even, you know, the most seasoned, you know, lifetime career politicians like Jason Kenney just get chewed up in it. And, uh, you know, it's a, uh, this in, in a lot of ways, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe it, maybe it would, I mean, a lot of ways, this place is, this province is really hard to govern because we are, we are so unruly in some ways. And, and I mean, the conservative movement on its own is pretty unruly, but, but we've also, you know, recently we've introduced this new thing called competitive electoral politics, 
So not only are the political coalitions unruly, especially the conservatives now, but but you know you also have competitive politics with with another political party that might be able to form government in the next election. So I don't think we've really worked that out in terms of our our own politics and how we how we function in that. And I think that's kind of an ongoing process. I think it's a healthy thing, but I don't necessarily think the way we're dealing with it is always healthy. Last follow up. What was the end? What was the end for Jason Kenney? What was the moment that you can look back on? You say, okay, this was the start of his decline. I, I hearken back to that open for summer sign. That moment, he 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 took a gamble, and I give him credit for taking a gamble, right? Because people were pissed. People wanted to start doing having things again, and then that summer was a complete shit show. That was mine. What was mm -hmm. that moment for you when you said, okay, Jason Kenny's days are kind of numbered here? Oh, yeah, I think Open for Summer was was the big one. That was the real death knell, I think, for, for his political career because it was just so, uh, hor it went so horribly wrong and people died and, you know, lots of people got sick and, you know, real world Real, real things happen in the world that, that had had severe consequences on a lot of people. But I think before then, you know, you could kind of see the writing on the wall in terms of the fights they were having. I mean, you go back to the, uh, you know, the the plan to privatize and sell provincial parks and the big oh, the big pushback across the province. You saw line lawn signs going up saying protect our protect our, our Alberta parks. Lawn signs in every neighborhood. Every demographic, every economic back, socioeconomic background, rich neighborhoods, working class neighborhoods were putting up these signs. Um, you know, he really, they really misread Albertans on on those types of things. And as we saw a little later with with the the you know their decision to try to open up coal mining, open pit coal mining in the Rockies, is they kind of forgot how to speak to some of their to some some of their pretty substantial supporters. When you had the mayors of whatever dozens of communities in southwest Alberta. Um, speaking out against the, against the opening uh, the opening of open pit coal mining in in uh, in the eastern slopes in the rockies and you know the premier going on facebook live and and being kind of glib about it and saying it was just urban marxist green marxists who were opposing him um you know some of these people who are opposing him are like you know sixth or seventh generation ranchers on the eastern conservative slopes conservative blue and you know, blue <laughs> These are conservative people, right? But they're also conservationists and they also live on the land and they're stewards of the land and they understand that. And, you know, when you had a, you know, premier acting pretty glib about it and, you know, maybe, maybe they were, you know, maybe Kenny's, you know, his biggest weakness was he thought he was too clever by half and, uh, and, you know, in politics and, you know, you gotta, you can't, uh, you can't be as aggressive all the time and you can't be on, on the offense all the time. You gotta listen, you know, find that bandwagon and get in front of it. Like Ralph Klein, uh, you know, famously said. I'm going to ask one last small question. That's a quick question. This one's actually a quick question. Prediction. Who wins October 6th? <laughs> do, you um, want to, can you, can, uh, do, you, do you even want to try to make a prediction on that? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it looks like Dan, it looks it looks it looks like Daniel Smith. The people I talked to in the other other leadership campaigns, they all kind of quietly or openly to me, uh, you know, admit that they think Daniel Smith has a very good chance of winning. So I think I mean, you it's and all I are talking to the same people, the, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's all going to depend on who the second place votes go to. So who gets eliminated? To where does Danielle Smith's if she if she's not able to win on the first ballot, where are her second place votes going to come from? And at what point are those candidates going to be eliminated? If she's got to get tra uh, Todd Lowen's second place votes, if she has to get Brian Jean's second place votes, uh, that all you know those votes only get given to her when those guys get eliminated from the ballot. So, you know, are the other candidates, are they going to go if Taves, if Taves is in second place, just like that, as that poll that Rick Bell was writing about uh, uh, this week talked about, you know, are Rebecca Schultz votes going to go to uh, to Travis Taves are, you know, are those other votes going to go to him? Or are they going to go to Danielle? Um, you know, and how many people have marked, you know, if they mark their first, second or third choice, how many people are marking their fourth, fifth or sixth choice? You know, so some of those votes might just disappear. So, True. you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see. I think she's got a good shot at it. And you know, everybody seems to think she's going to win. But, you know, if you go back to other leadership races, everybody thought Gary Maher and Jim Denning hey, were going to be premier. Uh, we all remember leader didn't. of the official opposition, Maxime Bernier and Peter McKay yeah. and yeah. all those fun things of Gary Maher as premier. And yeah, so let's wait till the ballots are counted. Dave, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Um, greatly appreciate it, as always, to have you on the show. Thank you very much, Chris. It's been a, it's been an absolute, absolute pleasure. And, uh, 
uh, just like you, I'll be looking forward to seeing uh, what happens when those ballots are counted. So with that, I want to remind everyone we are off next week. This is our last show in September until October, where we are sitting down with 15 mayors and councillors from across Canada to talk about municipal issues, because it's usually the issues that are forgotten about the most, particularly in politics. So with that, remind everyone, get off social media for at least five minutes a day. Go have a conversation with someone. Helps our democracy, helps our society, and helps us be a better people. So with that, this has been the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself a excellent day and remember everyone keep talking